Hello everyone, welcome back to Night Call. So after a not so successful day yesterday, or I don't know, I don't know if it was successful. On one hand it was successful because we met this one guy, this whistleblower, who agreed to help us, but on the other hand I feel like we wasted some roots, especially with the with the guy that we didn't understand. But now we're home and I am interested. So is this night three now or is this still night two? But I think we spent all of our night two with driving because I think we had to make the decision to return back home if we wanted to analyze some more clues or something. So at the foot of your front door, just behind a drain pipe, you notice an envelope. It's thick and heavy. You can just make out your name written in thick black marker on the front. Your real name. You take a deep breath and go inside. In the envelope you find more information, just as Boucher promised. Okay. You lay them on a the table. You take a few more minutes to update your board with your new clues. Your neighbor flushes the toilet. Out of the corner of your eye you can see the pipes shake. It's time to get moving on your investigation. Oh, okay, okay, so that kind of makes me happy because I thought that we kind of had to manage to when we drive and when we analyze. I'm kind of relieved that we now have time to do both. Okay, so these are two police reports from victims. Three, okay. Here's a picture of the fourth crime scene. Um, I just want to look first. The death resembled an execution. I mean this could have been a cop or something? Maybe. Hmm. The victim the fourth victim was responsible for the Richtoden scandal. It was he was never trialed. Okay, he belongs he, that means Hervé and Pierrot are both could both have a motive. At least for victim four. But I mean, we met um, Hervé today. And did he really seem like he would murder someone? I don't know. Okay, what's that? A killer knew the victims or researched them. Okay, we had that before. So maybe if he knew the victims. I mean, it could also have been that, yeah, the victim four might have been responsible for this Rick Toden scandal. But what about the first three? I mean, why would he have a reason? Oh no, he worked for Charles Bougrain, victim two in the 90s. Okay, he, he worked for the one guy, which was victim number two, and then he, now he in victim number four was also something that had something to do with him. Huh. Well, well, no sign of violence. Maybe there was no sign of violence because he doesn't seem like a dangerous person. I mean, we saw him. He kind of looked, he looked kind of nice and he was friendly and I don't know. So maybe that's the reason why there was no violence because they didn't see him as a threat. I mean, if the victim number two was his former boss, then he would have known him be from before. So there would have been no need. And if they were killed with one bullet in the neck, they, they, I don't know, this must have then it would have happened very sudden and not with a lot of fighting before. So I mean, it would just probably be enough to turn your back onto him, on him and then he would shoot you. I mean, the other, okay, the killer knew the victims. So I mean, for two, for half of the victims, that is the case, I guess, for him. So that he knew them because he's a homeless guy. So I don't know if he really could have researched them or not. The weapon is a rare gun used in the 70s. Okay, that doesn't really tell us much, does it? Okay, just that it could be linked to him. Killer takes satisfaction. Why would it be on all of those four but not him? Huh. Victims killed with one bullet in the neck. No sign of violence. You deserve this. Message on crime scene two. Why is it why is he for you deserve this as well? So what 
connection did he have to the second victim? So, um, well then, I don't really have... <laughs> that didn't really help much. Okay, we have a picture of the crime scene for... I guess we should look into this. So, which is the new clue? A spent bullet case. Question is, is it the same weapon, the rare one from the 70s, or not? Hmm. Okay. Oh well, now we have some case files that would all take a really long time to read. Who do we have here? Okay, we have the police report of victim 2, which is the one that was the former boss of Hervé. Maybe it would be uh, good to look into this guy first. And he's victim 3. We don't really know anything about victim 3 so far or about any connections, right? No. No. No, he is connected to Charles Bougon and also probably to the victim number four. He too. He's also to victim number four. Okay. Oh well, um, I think I'm gonna take a look at his report first. Okay, we have not enough time to analyze any of the other. So what do we have here? A stolen wallet, okay. Victim 2 killed in only spot without CCTV. Okay. Um, well. Which is kind of interesting because the thing that she told us, that Ade told us, is that the killings are not about money. And now there's a stolen wallet as well. I mean, it would make sense if that he just... I don't know, killed him not because he needed the money, but because of redemption or revenge or something. And then he just took it because why not? And there was and there wasn't a camera. I mean the thing is we don't really know what happened to Charles Bourgrin. If he had a grudge against him or not. So what happens if I press the mouse wheel? Oh no. Okay. Well that's interesting for sure, but the problem is that we can't really we can't look at anything else because we don't have enough time. We can't look at any more um, reports. So let's just end the night then. With a heavy hand you wipe your tired face. You slowly open the sofa bed and lie down. The events of the day run through your head. The streets, the passengers, their faces, their problems. Your brain is running at full speed, your body aches and you're in pain. You can tell you need to get more sleep. You glance at your investigation board. It's slowly filling up. You wipe your hand over your face like it'll help sleep come. Your fingers are shaking, stressed probably. You shake your head and your mind wanders for a second. A smile forms on your lips. You just thought about the Japanese tourist. You imagined the joy on his face when he got home and rediscovered the sounds and smells of his country. Like you, when you would come back from France, at the end of the summer. Your eyelids flutter once and you're asleep. You open one eye. It's pitch black outside, time for work. You get up quickly. And a few minutes later, you're outside of your studio. Okay, night three. Oof. Okay, so I just want to know, what are these eye symbols? There's one close by, so I want to see what that means. From outside, the Montparnasse gun store looks like any other shop. A plain, discreet front window, sliding doors. But inside, they sell handguns, machine guns, knives, and even grenades. It's your first time here, but you've already had its owner in your cap. The store opens really early so that patrons can come train at the shooting range. 
As you walk up to the counter, you hear the distant noise of gunshots under your feet. It's an unsettling experience. Mm, can I help you? It's the owner speaking, an older woman with a hunched back. She's been selling weapons since the 70s. She's cheeky in a typically Parisian way, and her wrinkles carve craters across her face. Ah, it's you! It's been ages. Come closer. You make small talk and eventually decide to go for it. I have a question for you, about a weapon. You slide the photo of the shell across the counter. She looks slowly up at you. Where's the photo from? She's been doing this for years and you doubt you can pull one over on her. You doubt you can pull one over on her, so I guess we need to tell her the truth. The cops? Yeah, and you're just, just how did you end up with police photos? I'm helping them out. You know perfectly well this lady never smiles, but something on her face shifts ever so slightly into what might be construed as a small grin. I'm not surprised. You were always the type to want to help people out. She practically rips the photo out of your hands. You give her as many details as you can. She thinks for a while. The shop door is open and a woman, probably a cop from her appearance, comes in, greets the owner and disappears downstairs. When she opens the door, it creaks and the smell of gunpowder spreads through the shop. It's funny. This doesn't fit with what you told me. The shell is in perfect shape and you told me the bullets are also completely clean. But it's old ammo. You can tell. There are no scratches, but there are a few oxidation stains and... Her voice grows darker all of a sudden, like something had escaped from her. In my opinion, it's from an old weapon, perfectly maintained by someone who knew what they were doing. In light of what you told me, I'd say it belonged to a cop or a soldier. It could be a family weapon. Okay. It was a police service weapon in the 1970s. Either a cop held onto it or the guy you're looking for inherited it. That judge there, he's a pro. You raise your head to meet her gaze. Her old bones make that slight shift again. The one that could be construed as a smile. Or she, actually. You know, lots of women shoot, and I give classes if you have any lady friends who are interested. Uh, back in your cab. <laughs> you glance back at the shop. You don't know how this woman knew that. Anyway, you start your taxi. You have what you need to move forward with your investigation. And a coupon for a class on shooting automatic weapons. <laughs> oh, thanks, lady. Well, that really went well. I mean, that gave us a lot of information because now we have like two prime suspects and those are the two cops. So one of them is from the 70s himself. He's a retired cop and the other one has a cop as a father. So he could have inherited it. Very interesting. Well, who's close by? Let's talk to him. Let's go there. A cigarette. You want a cigarette? I need to go to Fabourg Saint Honoré. Oh, well, he gives a lot of money, so let's accept. The next passenger getting in your cab has a surprisingly calming presence. He gently closes his door and gives you an address on the other side of the city. You start driving. Is he a priest? Sensing by the caller. You sense your passenger wants to talk about the killer. It's simple. Since the first murder, everyone thinks they know something. Everyone thinks they saw something. And this passenger is no exception. Rather chilly out, isn't it? His voice is warm and deep. Finally, you notice his white collar. Okay, yeah. You're not too cold. Um, no, I'm all right. You've got a lot of grit to want to drive in this kind of weather. The holy water front froze yesterday. We had to pour boiling water over it to break the ice. He pauses for a moment. He looks at the car, the seats, the windows. It's funny. I'd never made the connection before today, but a taxi is kind of like a confessional. A small box removed from the world where two people can converse without the risk of being interrupted. 
He waits. You look at him in the rearview mirror. Do people blabber on about their lives? All the time, yeah. I'm not surprised. His face lights up. Why, yes, I'm doing exactly what my parishioners do when they come for confession. They start with small talk, the weather, their grandson, granddaughter, niece, their dog. Then they finally get around to what really matters. They share lies, trickery, stinginess. He sighs. I've been listening to people's confessions for over 15 years and it's funny, but no one has ever told me anything really serious. He's waiting to see how you react. No crimes? A slight smile on his face. There have been things that are hard on a personal level, but never anything illegal. It's just that the people I hear in confession have so much to say. Of course, we all have things we are ashamed of. Fried clearly understood the importance of the confession booth. He made it into something more modern, more attractive and less punitive. He pauses. Before going to seminary, I never doubted my calling, but since? He leans in closer, his voice is now lower and softer. Since then, I have a clearer understanding of the world. I can connect religions, schools of thought, ideas. And living in a country that is less and less religious, it's hard not to start wondering. Your passenger makes a sound like a cork popping from a wine bottle. I have something I want to tell you. It doesn't bother me that people stop believing or believe in something else. Why are faith more than another? He struggles to find his words. What bothers me is that I'm not bothered by it. It's like I've already accepted it. He looks outside. Is there such a thing as driver-passenger confidentiality? He pauses and bursts out laughing. I'm kidding, but I do wonder what people talk to you about. How would you feel about swapping stories? Sure. Really? I didn't think. He smiles. Nothing leaves this car, right? You nod. Who first? Um, you. Of course, it's only normal. There was this old man whose wife died very young. Since she was an avid churchgoer, he continued to come every Sunday morning. He clarifies. You should know that it's rare to see men alone at church. There are couples, lots of old ladies, mothers, young women. The church is not very manly, unfortunately. But anyway, he came. One day he asked me to take his confession. We sat down, a long moment of silence went by. I usually let them get acclimated to the muffled sounds coming from outside the booth, especially if it's their first time. And there he tells me that he's in love with someone, but doesn't dare betray his deceased wife. She was everything to him, you see, his son, his oxygen. For the last 20 years he'd been suffocating, incapable of living alone. He wondered if it was a sin or wrong if he might set his wife up in heaven. He pauses a minute to let a smile spread across his face. I managed to find the right words, but he still wasn't sure and said he'd come back to talk to me again. He stops. He died that night in his sleep. Oh my god. I think of him often. We don't always hear our calling. We avoid our own destiny. His expression freezes. He hesitates, opens his mouth, stops himself, and finally... Your turn. You look at him. My story's a bit like yours, actually. It's a story that haunts you. You think about it regularly. And not only because of everything that followed. The night of the terrorist attacks, the other drivers and I were helping people get home. We drove around, waved to people to get in, telling them it was okay, that everything was going to be alright. 
It was chaos. They all wanted to get home to their loved ones who weren't answering their phones. The slightest odd noise made them jump. Anyway, a woman and her husband got in the car. She wore a headscarf. He was glued to his phone. They gave me an address and we drove towards Rue de Rivoli. The radio was announcing the first estimations of the number of deaths. He started crying. She, she looked at me, stared at me in the rearview mirror like she wanted to read my mind. We almost arrived when he told her to take her scarf off, that it would be easier for everyone that way. She refused. He raised his voice. She continued to stare at me in the mirror. A car speeds in front of you. You stop talking. How reckless. You glance at the meter, the green light, your rearview mirror. In the back seat, your passenger leans slightly forward. And what did you do? I nodded, insinuating that she was right, that it will all come down to that. She kept her headscarf on. I pulled over in front of the building. She got out first, walked toward the building without waiting for him. He paid me, lowered his eyes. He takes a second to process the story. He holds your gaze, his hands clasped. Impressive. Very impressive. You're saying we should remain proud of and faithful to our convictions. You nod. Your passenger smiles, but something is not quite right, as if the smile were forced. Thank you for swapping stories with me. You've almost reached the destination. You notice your passenger has been keeping an eye at the dashboard clock. You park in front of the address he gave you and cut the motor. The passenger pays his fare and suddenly seems lighter, more at ease. Good luck. He gets out of the taxi and disappears into a nearby building. Well, oh wow, he gave a very large tip. Thank you very much, sir. So I really should keep in mind what the faces look like that we need to... I mean, the surfer guy, he appears very often, so maybe we should drive him. <laughs> maybe that's a sign. <laughs> that cat, too. You slow down a bit, you've just been hit with a migraine. You crack your window, icy Parisian air fills the cab. You need to rest. You need coffee. You need to close your eyes. Just a minute. One time, oh no, 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 don't do that. You don't need to sleep. You raise your head and see yourself sitting in the back seat. Whoa! Weird experience. You got clenches. No, it's more like someone is pulling your guts out. Yeah, I look like shit, I know. No surprise considering all the crap I eat, right? <laughs> oh, wow. He smirks, or maybe it's just a smile. You can't quite tell. I've just got one thing to say. It won't take too long. You'll be able to get back to defending the weak and the poor right after. And maybe cleaning up your reputation and that pretty face of yours. Thanks, me. I wonder why I'm not in the driver's seat. You hear a knuckle crack, but neither of you budged. Frankly, it would be just be easier for everyone. Another knuckle crack. If I were behind the wheel and you were in the back of my mind? Of my conscience? A whole handful of knuckles crack, your shoulders quake. But no, that's not how this works. What do you want? Me? Nothing. You want to get out of the awful deal you made with that bitch of a lady cop. He makes a whistling with his teeth. You remember the night when the judge? He rolls his eyes. What a stupid name. You remember the night I'm talking about? You nod slowly. Say it. Say you remember. It's important. I don't. No, we're not going to get anywhere, my dear, if you refuse to face the wounds of your past. For just a second, you think you recognize the voice, a woman, a friend's voice. 
go ahead. His voice is grating, it makes your head spin. Say you remember. Okay, well then maybe we need to say I remember? I remember. When the killer attacked you, you saw his hand. He was wearing gloves. Yes, he was wearing gloves. Rubber gloves with talcum powder on them. I know what you told that bitch. I was there, you remember? I said he was wearing gloves. I'm not talking about his gloves, I'm talking about his hand. His hand? The rubber was torn and you saw something. He stares at you. God damn it, out with it, remember! It's not hard! His voice sounds compressed, compacted, smushed, the last syllable rings in your ears like a scream. You remember the gloved hand, the hall light shining, wrinkles on his skin. You jump as a car flies by right next to the taxi and honks. You'd fallen asleep. After sitting still for a second you start the car, but the image of that wrinkled hand haunts you. Okay, so I guess... Hey, where's the sur surfer boy? Was surfer boy just there to make us remember? Hmm, okay, where shall we go next? Who's this guy? Who's... Isn't that Hervé? Let's just see him, although he does... he never pays us, so... No, he just looks like him. Oh, okay. Well, he pays a lot, so let's accept that. Okay, so I guess the suspicion intensifies towards the retired cop guy. Your passenger climbs into the cab and slams the door shut behind him. Good evening. Plain Saint Denis, please. He stops short, visibly sizing you up. Do you know where it is? You nod, yes. Avenue des Magasins Généraux, so you know the street. Yes, sure. He looks at you intently. You know all the streets of Paris. His question drips with disbelief. You know his kind well, the sort would refer to you as the, Ar the Arab and not bad an eyelid. Um, yes, I do, monsieur. He seems hesitant. Well then, let's go. You start the cab. Your client stares out the window as if hypnotized. You watch him in the rearview mirror. His face is familiar to you, his accent too, though you'd never be able to place it. Typical for some rural region, central France perhaps. You take another look. That's it, you've got it. He was a contestant on one of those reality shows where farmers meet women. Oh, wow, okay. You'd seen him on the show a few weeks before. You'd watched it from your hospital bed with a distracted eye. But something about it had bothered you. The show was a masquerade, life in the country seen from a very Parisian and cynical perspective. Full of scorn and contempt. Okay then, you figured out who I am? <laughs> Oh no, his remark and his accent bring you back to the present. Sorry. You've recognized me, right? So you can make fun of me now. Make fun of you? He shrugs. Yeah, like all those other people do out there on that there Tweety thing. Tweety? Takes you a second to realize he's talking about social media. <laughs> oh, Twitter. Um... I don't know what you mean by that. I mean, you don't know who I am? You hesitate before answering. Um, yes I do. I mean, I do, yes. Some kind of reality show, huh? Exactly. Why do people make fun of you? He heaves a long sigh as if letting off steam. His drawl has become more pronounced. At first the show was okay, and then I started seeing my face all over TV. On other shows, I mean. And then I find out the internet is laughing at me too. There are those those things, I can't remember what they're called. 
moms, mams, mims? You know, those pictures that move all by themselves on the damn internet. Well, I don't know if he means memes or gifs, but <laughs> I don't know. Gifs, not gifs. <laughs> you have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> Um, s uh, say nothing. So I made myself a Tweety account to go and see what they're saying about me. Calling me a virgin and a Nazi that I screw my cows to? Oh, oh wow. Well, I guess you weren't the popular guy, huh? He looks away as if someone else had spoken to the words. Practically die laughing a farmer who... He doesn't want to finish the sentence. So yesterday I said I'd had it. I called my cousin to keep an eye on my farm and I left for Paris. I'm on my way to see those TV jokers right now. Six months ago they said if there was any problem whatsoever they'd take care of it. Well, there is a problem. His anger has subsided somewhat. His face is returning to its normal color. What do you think they're going to do or what's your plan? What's your plan? Oh yes, I have a plan. I'm going to show up at their office and raise Cain until they listen to me. Okay. He gives you an energetic nod of the head. And believe me, they're going to listen. I may be just a plain old farmer, but nobody's gonna disrespect me. He squares his shoulders as if to fend off the attacks. Forget it. His eyes half closed, he practically growls the words. There is a palpable air of sadness about him. At first, I told him I didn't want to be on their stupid old show. It wasn't for me. But they insisted. They showed me pictures of the women. He lowers his eyes. And then, while well, I said yes, should never have said yes. You pull up to the address he gave you. The studio gates are still closed. You park the cab and cut the engine. Is it closed? You nod yes. It doesn't open up until six. You point to a sign posted near the gates. He sighs. But there'll be hardly anyone here before 9 or 10 o'clock. I don't care, I'll wait. He rummages through his pockets and pulls out a wallet. What are you going to ask them? I want them to apologize on TV during the show in front of everyone. That could be hard. To talk about all the things they changed, all the bits of sentences they cut up and put back together. He fixes his gaze on you, his eyes narrow. You know, I'm not racist. His voice is low and raspy. Don't believe the show. I didn't mean what I said, and I didn't really say that stuff either. What exactly did you say? He stops short. I... nothing. He avoids your gaze, then all at once says... A lot of nonsense. He fixes his gaze on you, visibly moved. I'm not very good at this. I've been... He chokes up, gesturing with a hand as if to make it all disappear. When he starts up again, he's on the verge of tears. Anyhow, I'll just wait here until it opens. The passenger pays the fare and exits the cab. You watch him for a minute as he starts his vigil in front of the gates. You notice a newspaper on the back seat. Your last passenger must have left it behind, or the one before. You grab it and put it away. Could come in handy. Then you start the cap. It's back to the grind. Well, he left a generous tip too. Thank you, good sir. That will certainly pay my gas bills. Ooh, there's something close by. And there's a surfer dude again. 